Welcome to High Stakes, episode 23. I'm your host, Neil Orfield. You can find me on Twitter at PlayerQDFS. High Stakes is produced by Mike Lawrence, as usual. You can find him on Twitter at AwesomeYo. And our guest today is Kane Smith. You can find him on Twitter at no Kane, no Game. That's K with a K. No Kane, no Game on Twitter. Same username on both DraftKings and FanDuel. No Kane, no Game. Kane has been a crusher at esports DFS for a couple of years now, since uh, 2020. I think uh, during during the pandemic, Kane kind of took off in esports DFS, and then more recently this summer, Kane has been absolutely crushing MLB. Uh, Kane, how are you doing today? I'm doing great. Thanks for having me on, Neil. Let's talk about that name for a second because I had to reread it a couple of times. I've always thought it was No Kane, No Pain, because you know, like, yeah, why'd you go with No Game there? Uh, because I'm an uh, idiot. <laughs> no, but, uh, honestly, like it just, it, I really wanted, I should have been no cane, no pain, but I was a high school student trying to be cool. And I was like, okay, what's the coolest username I can come up with? And I put no cane, no game. I was like, oh, it sounds good, but that's not the same. <laughs> but, you, uh, it works. Stuck. You yeah, can't, you can't play the game without cane, I guess. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Something like that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. All right. Stuck and people liked it. So. No, yeah. It's a, it's a good screen. I just, I, I always read it as no cane, no gain. And it's like, oh no, it's no no cane, no no game. Okay, that's that's good to know. All right, no good 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 screen name. Um, all right, let's start let's start talking about your uh, your Twitter profile. At the top says Michael Vick once told me he didn't know Panera delivered. What's the uh, the context of that quote? Did did that really happen? Michael Vick told you he didn't know Panera delivered? Yes, it's, it's a true story. Um, in college, I worked at Panera Bread, and this is when I was attending Virginia Tech. Um, we'll get into like the college stuff a little later, but I was attending Virginia Tech as a delivery, and I was at, I was a uh, working at Panera Bread as a delivery driver. And this is when they first started having delivery, you know. So I was delivering the guys on people on campus at Virginia Tech, maybe sometimes go to Lane Stadium, go to the dorms. So I actually, there was a dorm that was near Lane, and I think there was a football game later that night. Okay, so I park over to wait for the student to come out to get their food out of my car. Next thing I know, I see a, a, a sedan pull up in front of me and just swoom in and just park right in front of me, like, all of a sudden. I was like, okay, that's weird. And then next thing I know, I see a, I see like these big guys get out of a car and they go to the trunk. And I'm like, okay, they're doing something weird. You don't really see this at Virginia Tech. I'm like, and then one of the guys, uh, one of the short, shorter guys uh, had like a number seven on his back and it looked like Michael Vick's brand. And I was like, hold on, that's Michael Vick right there. So I go on, I pull out, at the time it was an app called Snapchat. I think people still use Snapchat. And I pulled out my, snap, my phone to Snapchat it because people ain't going to believe that Michael Vick's right here. I, I start to record. One of the guys catches me recording. I pull the phone down. I was like, oh, shoot, I'm in trouble now. Uh, so then one of, the, one of his entourage comes over to the side of my, uh, on the driver's side of the car. He was like, hey, are you, were you recording us? I was like, I had to. That was Michael Vick right there. And he's like, oh, why didn't you just ask us, man? Just get a picture or something. I was like, yeah, I'm on the job. I don't want to bother him. He came up to the car. He was like, I didn't know Panera delivered. And that's the whole story. I mean. Did you get a picture had- with him? No, I didn't get a picture. I should have. I didn't want to bother him at the time, but I regret doing that. Like I said, I got the Snapchat video of him doing it. Like so, but like I pulled the phone down. You can see me pull the phone once they 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 looked me directly in the eyes, and I was like, oh crap! I because they probably I don't know they probably thought I was just recording because they were doing something suspicious or something. But yeah, I, well, I don't know what they were doing that day. So I don't want to I don't want to out myself as an old here, but uh, you using using Snapchat? Did you lose the video right away? Like you take the video and then it goes away after like. 20 seconds. Do you, do you still have the video? I don't have the video because I don't have the Snapchat no more. And I'm pretty sure if I if I had my Snapchat account that you would be able to pull it up. Maybe I deactivated the Snapchat account like a couple of years oh, okay. ago. All but, right. But well, it was, I did view it, show it that my friend. So it's not a complete lie. All right, all right. So my so friends some people. Me. <laughs> yeah. All right. All right. Good enough. Yeah. Uh, I, while we're on the topic of you meeting famous people, uh, you mentioned on Twitter that uh, you played football against greg dorch in high school uh what was that was he the best player you ever played against um he's the most successful one i think so far um at the time uh greg greg dorch was a sophomore and i was a senior so and I, and we play this team every year like since i was a freshman so i know what the players on the team and maybe my coach was did some scouting but this is the second game i think out of the season so we really didn't have much film on this team and especially the, the young guy greg dorch at the time so he wasn't really my main concern. I'm gonna be honest with you. Uh, and obviously, he caught a 60-yard bomb on us. It's on his highlight tape if anybody wants to see it. So, 
But you, play, you played middle linebacker, right? Yeah, I played middle linebacker in high school. Yep. Yeah, so so you weren't really on Greg Dortch, uh, most likely. And were you where where did you grow up? Were you in like because uh, you went to school in Virginia? Do you say so? Or are you from uh, kind of the southeast there? Uh, I'm from uh, Richmond, Virginia, so Central Virginia. Okay. Yeah. What yeah. What's the high school football culture like in in Virginia? Oh, it's it's pretty competitive. Like, okay, it's, it's real because I um I went to a Division three school. I actually went and played football at college for one semester. Um, but like a lot of people go to college, big name colleges. In fact, like Morgan Moses, the starting right tackle for Baltimore Ravens, he went to my high school. Oh wow. NFL, and, Yeah, protects Lamar and stuff like that. Ron nice. Blocker. Yeah, so so it's a lot of talent that comes out of Richmond area, and it's been, it's a very competitive. You know, the junior football in, in general, I think, is really competitive. I just wish they stayed home and went to check, uh, go to Tech and stuff. Virginia yeah. Tech. Right, right. <laughs> All right. Well, that's a that's a cool story. Um, Greg Dorch, of course, being the week two darling of DFS this week uh, had in case anybody watching is not a big NFL fan or doesn't play NFL DFS. That's why I bring up Greg Dorch because he had a touchdown this past week. He was kind of chalky. A lot of people played him and then he, he panned out for him. So uh, definitely looks like a, a good young football player. Um, but we're not here to talk about uh, your, your football escapades. Let's talk a little bit more about uh, your DFS because you've been crushing DFS and that's what we're here to talk about. And I, I always start by just kind of getting into your background a little bit. I want to hear the backgrounds of uh, the pros or, or maybe you don't consider yourself a pro, but the great players that I'm playing against. Uh, so let's just talk some background. We'll start here. What kind of background do you have in statistics? Do you have uh, formal or informal training? Yeah. So um, I graduated with a civil engineering degree from tech. Um, and we, and one of the requirements is to take a, a statistic like course. Now I had also like prior statistics like classes before I even went to tech. Like I think I dove into it a little bit in high school here and there. Um, and then I, I remember when I actually started playing DFS, uh, I tried to take a summer summer course on statistics, but I dropped out of the first day. I was like, this is not what I like. Cause they're talking about other stuff that I don't care about. I only care about the DFS part, but that was back when I was first starting just to like get a little bit more information about statistics, but just the regular college curriculum that I went through. Okay. Yeah. So I've thought about doing the same thing, going back and just taking like a summer course or something. Cause I don't really have a strong background in statistics. I have some understanding of it, but uh, just kind of by happenstance, I've never really taken a statistics course. So uh, sorry to hear that it was not DFS focused. I'll need to find one that's actually DFS focused. So I can, yeah. you know, yeah, avoid all the, all the stuff that's not necessary for DFS. Yeah. If I find one, I should tell you, is that what you're saying? Yeah. 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 All right. <laughs> All right. So uh, you're, you're an engineer, but I'll, I'll ask, uh, what, what kind of training formal info do you have in computer programming? Um, so again, we did a little bit of programming. Now it's not so engineering. We don't use programming that much, but I think in your introduction engineering classes, they make you like do a little bit of programming, but that's not my area of specialty. Now, okay. like I, I know like some language about it, but it's just something I'm not even interested in. And I really don't even use it in my process. Okay. So it's not part of your DFS process at all? No. And maybe if I, become full-time or something, I might try to do some automa like automation, but and, but it has to be worth the time. So, cause like, because I know, like, speaking to other people that have been on this podcast, you know, uh, it might not do everything you want it to do. And, or if it does, it, it won't do it as good as you could. Yep. And that's, that has always been kind of my mindset is maybe I could learn how to do some of this stuff my on, on my own, but then uh, could I do it better than just using the stochastic tools that I'm using now? And the answer that I keep coming back to is probably not. So what's uh, what's the point in spending my time there? Better better to spend my time elsewhere because I don't have much of a background. Obviously, if you, if you have more of a background in computer programming, I can understand why some people would want to do it on their own. But yeah, I, I have never uh, made that leap on my own. Um, all right, let's, let's talk about your professional background just a little bit or any related hobbies, hobbies related to DFS uh, mm -hmm. to kind of get an idea of why you are, uh, you know, suited for DFS or, or why, why it appeals to you. So let's just start with, uh, tell me about your professional and or related hobbies. Your background. Yeah, like, like I said, uh, right now we're full-time as civil engineer. Um, I'm still one of the younger people in the office. So it's not like I'm out here designing, like, you know, it's a straight road. Like I'm just helping them out right now. I'm not, I'm not even licensed right now, but I still work under the titles of transportation engineer. Um, and, and for fun, I mean, I'm a sports, I'm a sports bro. I feel like at the same okay. time. So I love the engineer. I'm an engineer, but I'm also a sports bro. Like I like to play basketball. I like to play 2k, the video game, 2k basketball, 2k. Yep, yep. Yeah. So I mean, I'm just a regular guy in, in, in that aspect. Okay. But I mean, be, being a sports fan and an athlete yourself, I think it kind of, you know, helps 
in terms of DFS a little bit. Obviously, it can, it can be a deterrent for some people too. If you're, you know, you just look at it from a fan's perspective and not from a like mathematical perspective, I think it can be a, a detriment to some people. But uh, with your background, I think that is probably helpful because you kind of understand the context of the sports fandom. Uh, yeah. All right. So, uh, when when approximately did you start getting involved in DFS and, and what drew you in? Was it just your sports fandom or was there more to it? Um, sports fan kind of thing. Uh, I think back in 2016, so I think around my sophomore, junior year of college, uh, Golden State uh, was playing Cleveland in the finals. And my friend was like, hey, I was doing pretty good. Clay Thompson hit some shots previous game. I was like top seven on the lead boys. So I was like, well, I know my so let me do it. But I mean, I, I'm laughing because knowing the sport does not mean you, you're good at DFS. I mean, I figured that out pretty quickly. But yeah. so that's when my first taste of it was 2016 NBA. Uh, finals and were you a winning player right away uh no <laughs> no i mean i played uh and, and i also wasn't playing obviously i wasn't playing a lot of volume i just played here and there i was in college so i played when i could play out though in like um uh, uh, entry into the big tournament just to see just to try to like you know host win a lot of money but it wasn't nothing serious from the beginning so i wasn't yeah. making any money <laughs> let's actually let, let's keep keep going around uh from from that path going forwards to today so you you started playing NBA, right? And at this point, you know, just looking through your results, NBA doesn't look like it's a sport that you've had the most success with. So where where did you start finding success? Um, so fast forward like three more years later, like once I graduated college in 2019, I uh, got my big boy job, my first big boy job. Um, so I had some extra additional income to use. So this is when I started like you pulling out the Excel sheets and, and doing all that stuff for DFS. Um, and that was I started off in the NFL season because, you know, that's that fall, whatever, right after college, you graduate in the uh, yep. spring. So I started, you know, I just did NFL. Um, don't think I did good. I, I don't remember how, how it was. I don't, I didn't look at a road tracker or anything like that. But um, shortly after, like, I started getting decent at college football um, later on that fall. And then I think shortly COVID happened. So then I was like, okay, I have this additional income. I'm trying to learn this stuff and, and COVID happened. So what can I play next is, the only thing you can play, you can play MMA, Fight Island, or you can try to learn something else. And I picked up esports. And you did you have success in esports right away? Um, I, I would say yes, because I had my first big win. Um, short, like, like I think in June of 2020, I believe. So, like, um, I had my first big win in general in DFS. It was on it was in CSGO, and I think I tied. I had two entries tied in first place with another guy and I, I took home $32,000 in CSGO. Ooh. Yeah. I'm seeing, so I'm, I'm looking at your, your Roto Grinders page right now, June 4th, 2020. It looks like this shows you having three, but these uh, are not always accurate. So it has, it has you in first place three times in CSGO on June 4th, 2020, a contest of nearly 8,000 people uh, splitting first with yourself three ways. Uh, and then, you know, maybe just one of the guy, but also it could be just two and they got it wrong here. No, it, um, it, it's three. Uh, one, I think I uh, had the same, like two, one was the same lineup and another one was a different lineup with the same score. So it just happened. So oh, funny. Yeah, is, yeah. is that a common thing in CSGO? Um, you do, you can't tie in CSGO, uh, but it depends really on how large the slate is. If it's a two gamer, I, I, you can see some ties. It's not, it's not that like crazy like it is in League of Legends where you get a lot of time in League, League of Legends. But you do get some time uh, occasionally. Okay, and now so so I sort of lump all esports together because I've never played them. Uh, is is League of Legends your or CS:GO your best? What I'll, I'll just leave it, I guess, more open. And <laughs> is there a particular esport that you think you're best at, or uh, how, how would you rank your your favorite esports? Um, favorite to actually watch is probably CS:GO. Um, I played a lot of Call of Duty growing up, so it's very similar to Search and Destroy. So, like watching those teams play, it's kind of like something I'm familiar with. Okay. But I have made more of a return on League of Legends uh, over time. But like, and I, but in all honesty, I kind of like playing CS:GO more than League of Legends. I still yeah. make some money on CS:GO, so so it works out. <laughs> all right. So so you've had some success at, at both of those two. Any other esports that you play? Uh, I played Valorant, um, and actually the first contest of Valorant, I think they had like a $10,000 for first, and I didn't have really knowledge of the players in Valorant at the time, but I could have shipped it. I remember I left Sally on the table, and we can talk about this later. Yeah. Uh, I left Sally on the table, uh, and I could have picked like the best player. Like I didn't know like, he was the best player in Valorant, and I could have shipped it, but I tried to be cute. Left Sally on the table, came in like third or fourth. Like, I, I could have uh. shipped the first Valorant contest. But and now they barely have Valorant, so I okay. wish they had it more. 
I'm just, I'm looking at your page. I've seen things like LCKLPL. Do you know what that mm -hmm. is? After what, what does that mean? So LCK is the Korean league. Uh, so LCK and LPL are like the top uh, leagues for League of Legends. Like they're like the number one. Oh, it's League of Legends. Okay. Favorite of the three League of Legends. LCK is the Korean uh, Korean top league, and uh, LPL is the Chinese top league. Okay. Well, it, it looks based on your page, it looks like you've been crushing a lot of different esports for uh, for a long time since since 2020. Uh, what I'm not seeing is any FanDuel entries here. So you have your name listed on your Rotogrinders profile, but I don't see a single fan. Did you just give up on FanDuel at some point? Um, so, yeah, yes. Um, so I, I tell the story. Uh, 2019, right. uh, when I came out of college, um, I was playing college football like I was telling you and i was actually shipped the contest i tied in first with um fear my turtle um uh, and but i had like the same lineup six times and i don't know if this was a thing back in the day like you can't have like in a fan duel that's part of the rules I, i'm not sure that's what my friends say like i don't know if you can but i guess you can't have the same lineup of fan duel but essentially they end up um flagging my account and saying uh like i can't like i gotta sh show proof of identity which which companies do that and yeah. i'm like um I don't, I'll send you that. Like, I just want my money from this contest and I'm going to go to DraftKings. Like, I don't, I'm just, because I was already thinking about going to DraftKings anyway. And I haven't went back to FanDuel. I tried to try to get my account back, but it's like a long process. Like, they uh, don't get back to me. It's, I don't know, something weird. They asked me, why do I want the account back? And I said, to make money in DFS. Right. I'm not saying they're in FanDuel. It's probably a good, like, I'm, I'm trying to get back on it. And I will, a bit, like, especially if I decide to go fully professional one day, I need to get back on FanDuel. Yeah, I guess my question would be, why is FanDuel trying to stop you from playing on FanDuel? It seems bad for their business model. What? what sorry, I, I don't think I fully understand. What was the reasoning they gave you for banning your account? Well, well okay, the real reason. Um, so my friend, so initially I thought it was because I was playing this. I played the same line like six times, and I and I went tied with fear my turtle and all this stuff. It was probably weird. But really, what actually happened was I I, uh, I was in Virginia, and I signed up for the contest in Virginia, but I went on vacation into North Carolina, and then. I won the tournament in North Carolina. So then they want a proof of identity to make sure my location was right. Cause I don't know if, if North Carolina could do it then, like do sports fantasy. I'm not sure. Okay. But I know they can't do sports betting right now, like still. Oh, okay. So it was they were they were seeing that you were in a location that is banned at the time you that's weird though. Usually it's I, I, my inter, my understanding has always been it's about you can enter the contest basically from a place that you're allowed to play and then typically you can edit your lineups in places where you're not allowed to play so that's uh that surprises me and no i i'm fairly certain there's no rule against duping yourself <laughs> in us so yeah. i think i think your friends got that wrong <laughs> well yeah well, i mean we, we're just we just talk about anything and they, they those guys my friends i love them to death but they don't play it at the same level as we do per se. yeah yeah not a, not as serious of GFS, but yeah, I, I just played a 150 train by accident uh, last week in the FanDuel uh, single game slate just because I missed a lock. So I had 150 of the same lineup and uh, didn't cash, but I would have been pissed if they had banned me after that. So I don't, <laughs> I don't think that that's in the rules. Yeah, um, yeah. All right. So at this point in time, in which sport or sports do you think you have the biggest GFS edge? Um, right now, as far as like making actual like money, I think it's baseball because League of Legends is cool. It's like it's I can make money, I can win first place. But League of Legends, there's also a lot of ties and like it's the contest is just not as big. So I mean, yes, and, and the field is really getting smart for League of Legends. That's what I'm saying. Like before, when I first started playing CS:GO League of Legends, you wouldn't get that many ties. But now the the field is getting really uh, it's just getting smarter in general in League of Legends. And, and I think I, honestly, I think DraftKings needs to do something to try to change the scoring format for, for that, like because they. When, the, the the amount of time that kind of throws me off a little bit. I don't I don't like that. And then like you can have let's say you can predict like the right teams to win, and you will still lose money in League of Legends if, because if there's a lot of ties in first. It's just the way the structure is. So I mean, if if, if there was a higher prize structure and like better prize structure, and they change the scoring format, I would say League of Legends would be like uh, would be like my favorite contest to play. But okay. baseball is where it's at. It's more money in baseball. Yeah, there's a lot less duping in baseball. So when you win, you typically win the full prize. Obviously, there are some smaller slates where that can be a concern, but typically not as big of a concern. So yeah, I probably wouldn't enjoy a dupe heavy sport where there is, you know, smaller prize pools. It's I'm fine with it in like MMA where it's like 100,000, 200,000 the first wow. time you even when you dupe, you can make more money. But uh, yeah, probably wouldn't bother as much if there is a smaller prize pool. 
Hey guys, let me take a minute away from this conversation with Kane Smith to tell you about our sponsor, Odd Shopper. Make your best bet in 30 seconds or less with Odd Shopper. With hundreds of bets featured daily, Odd Shopper gives you the edge you need betting player props and game lines across all sports. Sign up for free now via the link in the video description below to gain access to our proprietary data, which will help you make your best bets. With expected win percentages and ROIs included, Odd Shopper uses the same DFS projections we use here at Stochastic to filter out the best bets available. Odd Shopper also features a parlay builder with optimized parlays and an arbitrage tool that identifies risk-free guaranteed profit bets that you can make across all sports books. So we, we got a listener question about, uh, about esports that I wanted to ask you. So he says, uh, Stephen Purdue says, using stochastic tools, I can cash out most lineups, but I'm definitely leaving a lot on the table due to a lack of esports knowledge. What are the key metrics to look for when setting lineups? Who are the best followers to keep up with news? Uh, thank you for the great tools. Okay, so let's start with what uh, what are key metrics that you look at when setting lineups for esports? And you, you can choose whatever esport you want to talk about here, I guess. All right, for League of Legends, it's a little bit different. Um, my process for League of Legends is, is really kind of, is really a lot different than my process for CSGO. Okay. But if you're looking for good information, because League of Legends has like a lot of people, uh, like they don't always release the starters in time and stuff like that. They or they release the star 30, 15, 20 minutes before the game. Uh, I mean, the best person on Twitter that I follow that you can like try to get that information, but you got to stay up at 3 a.m. or something to make okay. to even have that edge. Um, is Corizon Esports. Uh, I don't know who runs the account or anything. So if it's somebody bad, don't 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 quote me on there. But it's, it seems pretty <laughs> official. What's the uh, what's the spelling of that? Or uh, I think it's K K O R I Z O N Esports. Okay. And that's, okay. true, and that's true to hand. Yep. All right. So, so like horizon, but with a K. Okay, cool. Um, and I won't, uh, we won't hold you to that if that's not the exact spelling of this weird <laughs> I'll, word. I'll look uh, it up before the, uh, the podcast, but another one is getting that uh, stochastic discord because those guys are on it. They will tell you, and they will tell you before that sometimes some, some guys will find a random tweet and they'll, they'll put the information in there for you. So get on that discord. It's pretty good. All right. Good to hear. Um, and then uh, j just one final, more general question I wanted to ask you before we get into process, because it kind of came up before the show. So I wanted to hear your take on it. Are you a professional DFS player by your own definition? Uh, by my own definition, I'm not. Uh, it's not until uh, DFS is my main income. Uh, I still work uh, 40 plus hours at my engineering job. So um, is it something I wanted, I'm considering? Yes. It's, if I can, can support myself, it's something that I'm really considering. I already talked about with my girl already. And she said she's willing, willing to take that risk. So, okay. So, so it, it could happen. Yeah. If right, the so money's right. <laughs> if the money is right. If you keep winning like you have been, maybe you switch over to, uh, to DFS full time. And yeah, I mean, uh, might be the time now to strike while the iron's hot before the competition gets so good that it's hard to beat the rake. You know, that might be, might be something that we have to worry about going forward. So, sure. um, but yeah, makes sense. So not yet, because uh, you have the same definition that I do, that it's, uh, it's not my, for me, it's just, if I have a full-time job in general, I don't consider DFS to be my main profession. Even if it is, you know, technically my main source of income, it's still not like my, I'm not counting on it because I have a full-time job. So I think we have kind of the same definition there. Uh, all right, let's jump into process a little bit. Uh, I'll start you. How, do, do you do any simulations or use simulations from outside sources in your process? Um, so I, I guess I don't know what the term simulation is. Is that like, so you're, you're running different lineups and you're seeing like a, the, the range of outcomes if that if that's what you're talking about simulations. I do that sort of, and, okay, but yep. like I run, but, but I don't have my own little Excel program that's running like simulation, like, uh, like nerdy tenor or something like that. I don't have okay. something like that. Now I do crunch lineups and I look like, Hey, maybe there's some correlation here, like where this player does good in this situation, their fans points go up. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll try to run lineups, but that, that involves altering my projections just, just a little bit. Um, so really, like, I think if I'm correct, if you put like some randomness on your uh, certain, some, some parts of your projection, that's sort of like running simulations against each other. From, my, from that conversation that you had with Nerdy Tenor, and I think that's what I, you know, I do do that, so. Okay. Yeah, that was uh, that was something that I learned from uh, from Nerdy Tenor and Brick Seventy Five mentioned on the show that technically, anytime you run 
if you use an optimizer, you put a little bit of randomness on it, you are running simulations, uh, which is not what I think of simulations. I think of them as like building in correlations mm -hmm. and stuff where they're simulating the actual games um, and, and telling you, you know, sim simulating outcomes of games. But uh, that is also a type of simulation. So, yeah, I guess the, the real question I'm asking is, are you doing like a nerdy tenor kind of process? And it sounds like you're not you're not on that level. That's not part of your uh, your process where you're doing that kind of stuff outside on your own. No, no, he, no, I'm not doing that at all. I, I, I use a lot of tools. I, I just listen like to, to people like you and, and Jordan Cooper, stuff like that, just to try to understand how to build good lineups. And, and that's where I really attack it. And do you, do you use an optimizer? Yes, I, I, I use Fantasy Crunch. Okay. I would hope so since you are playing 150 lineups. You, you do. You, you MME uh, contest pretty regularly for your main sports, right? Like MLB, you're usually playing 150. Yeah, I MME me a lot. Um, you're, I'd rather, I, if I throw single entries in there, even I might take some shots at like, you know, throw into a, a big contest or whatever. Um, but that's just to get some like sweat in the game um, or just to keep up with it. You know, if I have a lineup I'm looking at, I can see like how that's competing and see the other players that are doing good and, and try to analyze lineups like that in that way. But for the most part, I'm, I'm 150. I'm, I like to play GBP. I don't, I rarely play cash. Okay. <laughs> so, yeah, I was I was I was going to ask you about that too. If you're uh, if you play any cash, I I never really got into cash too much, and and over time it just seemed like if I'm spending this much time on it, I don't just want to double my money, you know, on, on a good day. So um, yeah. yeah, not a cash game player either. Uh, wh what about projections? Do you create your own projections from scratch? Um, so I use um, for most sports, I use stochastic projections, but um, I do alter the projections a little bit based off what I think. Now okay. I don't go like too crazy, like when I'm dropping people like ten fantasy points. But I might adjust it based off like, you know, what is player's ceiling. Like if two players are really close to each to each other, I might bump one up if their ceiling is a little higher or something, just to get more exposure to them, even if and especially if they're low owned in that case. So that's the way I mess with projections, but I don't create my own. So casting does a pretty good job with it. Okay. So yeah, it sounds like your process is actually pretty similar to mine. So you are you're using Fantasy Cruncher and you're so are you are you doing so like my approach is, you know, I run a crunch, I see how much I'm getting of different players, and then I kind of incrementally change my projections as I go. Do you do that where you're like running crunch and then looking out turns out altering a little bit and then running another crunch or are you uh or is your process different in some way? Yeah, yeah. I'm pretty like I said, I'm I'm open about my process. So when I'm running cruncher, um I, I always run optimal line of crunch, like just like, hey, no, don't mess with any settings. Let me see what the what the crunch is spitting out. What's the highest projection? What's the ownership projection looking like? And and I I make sure to keep note of that. So when I'm making my lines, because I don't want to be too far off from it, but like I've, I also have my own research what I've done like for certain slates, like uh like just using lineup study and just trying to like, hey, you kind of want to go under ownership here, you know, you know, you never want to go like optimal ownership. It's just something that I just don't ever do. And I know you had questions for it later. I'll speak about it later. Okay. Sounds good. Sounds good. Uh, what, what about ownership projections? Do you do your own ownership projections or, or use outside sources? Um, I use stochastic, just solely just stochastic. And it's really just a baseline. Um, I don't hold that true in heart. Like if it's, if they're projecting a pitcher at 15% and he's actually 25%, it's not anything wrong with that. I really just use it as a general baseline. I, I don't really take it like, too seriously. Yeah, it's uh, me too. I mean, you, you can't count on them to be exactly right. There's going to be obviously some players who are not, uh, don't, their ownership projections are not perfect, but usually they give you a good idea of about how own players are going to be. So um, yeah, I wouldn't know where to begin making my own ownership projections. So we're on the same page there. Mm -hmm. uh, all right. So how much does ownership play a role for you in creating your lineups? Um, so again, I don't like to have high on lineups. It's just how I play. Uh, that's why I think I found success in League of Legends and baseball because um, I try to be different as possible. And it's like, and those two sports are very chaotic. So yeah, you can have a top stack like Colorado and um, Coors Field and stuff. Um, I won't play that if there's a high like percentage of players that, that want to play it. I might even like fully on fade it. But now I do run my own like look like my version of top stacks, but it's nothing like anything mathematical. It's, it's really just looking at pitcher ERA and pitchers innings and stuff like that. And I'll compare what stochastic has. And if it's pretty close, then I'll favor them more. But if it's like way off or stochastic has this, um, like it has like a top stack that this doesn't necessarily line up mine and the ownership is very high, then I might full on fade the top stack because I know it's going to be high on so. Okay, so so you do look at the top stacks tool, but it's not. Uh, but you also create your own top stacks tool to kind of, and you compare them against each other and kind of figure out your lineups yeah. from that standpoint. 
Yeah, because sometimes like I have a, a mid tier, like I said, I have like Atlanta Braves in there, like ranked in the middle. But so cast they might have them at the top, then I bump, you know, I would say I bump them up type of yep. deal. But there's sometimes where I would have players on the bottom on my uh, the, what I what I do my metrics, and and so cast will have something different. I'm and that's when I try, try to go I try to go different because then there's a little bit of uncertainty about that about a certain team. Okay. So just using core as an example, though, I'm just curious, like, so, so say you have uh, the Braves at cores and mm-hmm. stochastic says that they have a, uh, they're, they're projected to get 20% ownership, but they have a 25% chance of being the top stack on the day. Uh, like, would you still fade them even though they have positive leverage in the stochastic top stack tool, or would it kind of come down to, you know, what your, what your top stack tool is telling you as well? So like if, if I'm looking at mine, they're ranked like number two or three, and they're saying stochastic is number one, and they're getting twenty five percent ownership. Well, that's part of the leverage. I'm then at that point, I'm go, as you probably know, I'm going sixty percent, seventy percent. Okay. On them, yes. Yeah, so, so it's a different way to leverage it. I might go heavier. I might go on fade. It's, it's just the way it, it lines up. Okay. I, I just want to ask because you said like you know I like to play low owned teams, so I'm not going to be playing high owned teams. I just want to make sure. Uh, if that changes, I just want to double check if that changes, like based yeah. on leverage scores and stuff. So it's it's not a, a, an always thing. You never play the high own stuff. It's sometimes if it's if it looks like good chalk, you are willing to play high own teams or players. Yeah, and yes, I mean if you're playing those high own stacks, don't expect me. And this is just me personally. I'm not. This is not advice. If, you, if I'm playing those high own teams and I'm doing that six percent stack and the top stack is, is Atlanta Braves, but for this example, I'm not going to top pitcher most likely. As you right. know, I will full on fade the top pitcher just to get different. So I want to go over own on the, on the high stack and then go really low on on somewhere else just to try to like balance the lineup out. All right. So, so you mentioned Jordan Cooper and that's what he would, he would say lineups, not players. That's an example of, you know, sometimes even if the stack is high owned, you can still make a good lineup around that high owned stack. Um, yeah. I think that's uh, generally a, a good approach. Um, yeah. All right. And what about being duplicated? Is avoiding being duplicated by other players a big part of your strategy in any contest? Yeah, I, I, I'm so I just hate being duplicated because then because I I really play this play the game this uh, as a as a, not even for the money is good right the money is good I play everybody plays for the money but I really play for the competition and I hate time with people because I hate that oh this guy thought the same thing I did and then I don't I don't really like that feeling so I try to be as different as possible and obviously being different really in mo- in some sports will get you some tight prizes. Okay, so what uh are there any sports in particular where because like I. I get it. Like you don't want to be duped, but like in, you know, MLB on a large slate, I'm guessing that's not a huge concern of yours. Like you're not going to be fully duped too often on a big slate. Do you, are, are any of the sports you play uh, in particular sports that you think that is a big part of your process, like to avoid being duped? Yes. I, I try to be, I try to avoid being duped. I mean, especially with the real legend contest, because even if you like, let's say you do it right. And the chalk hits, for, but like, let's say you're in a league of legends tournament and it's a two game slate and the chalk teams hit. Well, the, you're going to be heavily duped. I mean, those are going to be the days I'll just the losses. That's fine. But there's going to be days where I go to, like, it's very chaotic in League of Legends. You can get upsets all the time. And I honestly think that's where the edge in League of Legends comes from because people don't take in consideration of the upsets. And they do happen at a substantial rate compared to other sports. So it's something like, you know, you like the days that um, I do win, I'm going to win big. And the days that in League of Legends where, where there's a lot of dupes, I'm probably not doing well because I that's not the way I make it. unless I have a random lineup that happen to be duped and it goes to the top. Like that's not it's just when you see dupe lineups, I, I it's not a contest I like. All right, yeah, I'm, I'm the same way with like NFL showdown, MMA are sports that to me the sports that I play that are you know big uh dupe concern kind of sports where I kind of try to avoid those. Uh, do you have any other, I, I know you said that your process, you're, you're an open book, you're, you're willing to share your process, but it's okay if you know if you don't want to share everything, but do you have any other good tips or tricks for uh, avoiding being duplicated in League of Legends? Um, as far as League of Legends, I mean, you're bound to get duped. So I, it's okay. just like, if you're, if you're making lines, maybe do something that's, uh, that the field usually doesn't do. And like, so, so I'm gonna bring this subject up because the Discord, they, they always wonder what happened this one day. So. Uh, this past summer, I shipped the contest one through 12, and it was because it was a four game slate, and I stacked a player from the opposing team in, in, on League of Legends. And people don't do that. Like, if you study winning lines, people would never do it. People do it in two game slates. All the top players do it in two game slates and stuff like that. But nobody does it in a four game slate. And they're like, oh, this guy's cheating, this, that, like, uh, in, the, in this Discord, like, he's part of the Russian mafia, whatever. But I'm going to be honest with you, I run a certain process, and, and, and I try to run every variation 
of League of Legends. So maybe I spit out 800 lineups and like any like line, based off like winning lineups. Like not I'm not putting a team at the captain spot, not stuff like that. Like I'm talking about optimal lineups. I try to get every possibility and I shore them down from there. But that day I was in a rush to make my League of Legends lines. And I did not set that setting to limit my opposing players. To, <laughs> and then yeah, I ended up somehow I got like, you know, players from the same game and they went off. And so that was just a lucky day. And I won 20,000 on League of Legends doing that. So would that would that be like the equivalent of playing a uh, batter against your pitcher kind of a thing? Uh, yeah, but like, you know, in two game slates in baseball, you, you do that, you know? Right, right. But, but it'd be like on, on a larger slate in baseball, doing that kind of by accident. Yeah, yeah, doing about doing it by accident, you're doing that, or like, um, I guess you know, occasionally in the NFL, you will have like opposing players against the defense, which I try to be cute sometimes and do that, like, because there's yeah. I see some correlations there, like some tight end versus defense, opposing defense and stuff. But you really don't really want to like make if you're doing 150 lines, you shouldn't try to make that a goal. You should really have no players against your defense. So is, is correlation something that you study like on your own? Cause I know, I mean, you're a busy guy, you've got a full-time job on top of making lineups. Uh, but is that something that you, is that part of your process? Like studying the little correlations in the sports you play? Yeah. Correlations is, is, is a big part of it. It's just um, like if certain players go off with each other, they go off. And it's also like whatever draft king prices people at, I mean, you know where to take advantage of it. You just got to find the patterns and, and find the correlation. Like what players go good with each other. Even if it happens in CSGO, Happens in League of Legends. Now, and it's not it's not the end all be all, but if you kind of follow that close line, you know you you'll 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 win money over time. So okay, all right, uh, sounds good. Let's talk a little bit about uh, just specific process uh, for MLB. I'm just curious a little bit about your process. So, how long before the first game's locked do you typically get started working on a given slate? So uh, throughout the day, and anytime I have free time for my job, especially when I'm uh, working at home. Um, I, I'll look at the pitchers because, you know, as you know, baseball pitchers are, are the starters of pitchers are already released. So that's when I'll start trying to like do um, like, like make my little model, but what I think the top stack should be. And, uh, and I, I'll look at the pitchers and stuff like that. So I start that probably in the morning sometime. Um, I, it's crazy because the NFL, NBA, I watch all the uh, stochastic live shows. Like I do everything because it's all news work. It's, you got to keep up with the news to even be competitive. But for baseball, I really I try to shy away from the uh, the shows, and it's not not because Adam or Lofia they're not putting out the content. They are. It's just I will, in my process when I'm doing it, I'm like, oh, Adam said this, so let me change my ownership. I don't want any bias at all. So is that's what works for me in baseball? That's probably why I have a little bit more success in baseball than I do in NFL. But that's probably really not it. But it's that. And then as, when I, when I'm actually making my 150 lineups, like. I really don't try to mess with settings and stuff until I can get as many lineups as I can that have the starting line. Yep. So, so I don't really don't, I, like if I start messing it at three o'clock, it's way different. You will get way different uh, like values at your own, on your lineups. Like uh, opposed to if you wait till like six o'clock to start messing with things. So I would really say like, yeah, I start looking at the pictures and develop my own model earlier in the day, but it's not really until six, six o'clock. Let's say the, the line of locks is seven fifteen or seven o five, whatever you have it. Um, that I'm really like grinding in fantasy country trying to get get the right lines. Okay. Yeah, I'm actually I'm I'm very similar. And I think that's uh something people can screw up. If you get, you know, you start making your lineups too early and then you just make little adjustments to those lineups, they're probably not going to be as good as if you wait until you have more lineups because at that point, you know, you're you're you can build lineups that fit better together if you once you have all the lineups and kind of know which teams are playing good shortstops or you know high value outfielders or whatever you the, the more information you have i think when you start making your lineups probably the better those lineups are going to work and uh yeah as far as as watching shows for mlb uh i'm doing a lot of shows this year but i got to admit last year I wasn't watching a lot of shows for MLB. It was kind of a, you know, 20 minute process for me to be making yeah. my lineups. And uh, it's uh, not as necessary for me. Whereas as you say, for, for NFL, NBA, I find it a lot more necessary kind of that news and hearing about it is uh, more valuable to me in, in those kind of sports than MLB, where it's pretty easy to, to make your own process. Yep. All right. Uh, we got a couple listener questions that I wanted to get to. Uh, I'll start with one from Andrew DeCourcy who asks, do you tweak your process from week to week, depending on your past results, good or bad? Also, when building lineups for NFL, is there a certain position you like to start building with more than any other? Uh, let, let's start with the first part of the question. And you can answer this about, you know, 
any any type of sport too. So it doesn't have to be week to week NFL, but any sport. Do you tweak your process uh, from week to week or day to day, depending on your past results, good or bad? Um. So before I started 115 in any contest, I, I kind of do like a lot of research and back testing on my lineups. Uh, I don't know if other people do that. I hope so. They I hope they do. Like I run mock lineups and you know pick random days and run my process and see what I get. If I'm getting like some top 10 finishes in, in those lineups, then I know my process is pretty good. Um, even if I, I didn't play that slate at all, I have no prior knowledge of the slate. And that's the thing, and that's what I try to do. Um, so when I'm when I, I really don't try to trick my process. Now my process does change slate to slate though, because you know, I might use four, four, two, one, or whatever you have, whatever stack uh in baseball in a larger slate and in, in a bigger slate, I might go a little bit more aggressive and do five stacks. It just depends on what the what the data tells me to do. Okay. So so yes, you change uh day to day, but you try not to. I mean, well, that's just based on the slate itself, not just because yeah. of your past results. So it's not, it's not you're not tweaking it because of your results, you're tweaking it because you know, every slate is different. Is that, if I'm understanding you correctly? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I mean, if I need, if my processes are, are like, I'm not making money, then I know something needs to change, but I try not to change slate to slate. And, and, and like NFL is a hard example because you just don't know, you just don't have the data on it. Like I can look at, like I, I have looked at it myself. I looked at the, the winners for 2020 and 2019 NFL, but it really doesn't help you that much. I, obviously you can see stacks and how often certain stacks win and stuff, but um, like, developing like your baseballs every day like you can change your process but i once you find the process you should try to stick to it because you don't need to win every day that's not the key like i know there's going to be days where if there's a chalk pitcher and a chalk um a chalk stack that hits i'm not going to win that day and i just know that but how often does that happen it doesn't happen like where the highest on pitcher and the highest on stack go off together it just doesn't happen that often to me well at least okay. i haven't seen it. all right uh so we just, just kind of on that same train of thought, you mentioned Roto Tracker earlier. It sounds like, do, do you use Roto Tracker to kind of track your results? Yeah, when I started making mine, this is like, I didn't, when I'm losing, I don't want to see what I'm losing. That's, that's not me. But <laughs> so you're, when I'm, yeah. yeah, so I've been, I tracked it recently and, I, and I'm plus, in, uh, and I've been positive in, uh, in baseball, obviously esports. Um, I had my first positive season last year in NFL, NBA. Is one of my most volume sports. I love playing NBA, but I'm not good at NBA yet. Don't trust me on anything I say about NBA. <laughs> I'm really just a fan of NBA, and I'm I, and I've developed. You know, I'm studying the processes and trying to refine my own process. And I've been doing a little bit of MME and NBA at the smaller levels, and I've seen a little bit of success there. But I think I got a good process going into this season, based off like listening to people on this podcast and stuff like that. Like, because like as you know, like I play very chaotic. I'm a, a, like I can win. On chaotic sports like esports and baseball where you can be different but i need to not be as chaotic on those sports and like play the ownership and you so, so you typically try to play the largest field gpps is that correct or do you play uh smaller field stuff as well uh i play smaller fields when i want to test stuff out uh okay. just test my process uh, and then uh i play larger field once i start getting processes down i like I, that's what i like to target Okay. And, and large field is obviously, uh, there, there's a range of what can be considered large field. And if you're playing esports, it might be, you know, smaller <laughs> field than, than MLB, but, uh, the largest field you can find for esports. Uh, but w what I was going to ask about Roto Tracker is so on top of just tracking your money, are, are you also looking at like those other underlying metrics, like your, your 1% buckets, like how many lineups you put in the top 1% or are you mostly just looking at the, the money involved? Yeah, I mean, I, haven't, I didn't start looking at that until y'all mentioned it on the show. So I was like, oh, let me see how many lamps I'm actually getting. That, and that's the metric I use, honestly. So okay. I know my process is good if I'm getting a lot of a lot of lamps, and, and I have been, um, especially in baseball. Um, so like, I know the process works. I just got to keep using the process. Okay. So, yeah. So that's, uh, that's a big part of my press as well, checking my 1% buckets, making sure I'm staying on the right track, getting enough lineups into that top 1% or top 0.1%, whatever, whatever metric you want to look at. I think those are uh good indicators of how well you're doing mm -hmm. um all right then let's let's get to uh the second part of andrew's question which is when building lineups for nfl is there a certain position you like to start building with more than another all right in nfl and this applies to baseball i like to look at the key positions like uh for nfl um i look at obviously i start with a quarterback that's where i like to look especially if there's like a low on quarterback that has a high ceiling or something that's something i start that, those are what i start to hone in on um, but in, in NFL, when I make my lineups, like, like I think a lot of guys do this, they'll select a couple quarterbacks, like a handful of quarterbacks that they like, and then run lineups based off of that. Um, and the reason why I feel like people do that, they start with the quarterback and, and they get a handful, is because when you're 
like when you're putting lineups into the million dollar lineup, you gotta like kind of like uh like hone it in on a certain part of the field. And, and if you can hone in that part of the field, that's how you can take down a big target. That's just from what I'm looking at. I haven't I haven't took down a big NFL contest, but that's I feel like a lot of the good players, this is what they do. Because if you just run, okay, let's say you go out there with 150 lines with 10% of quarterbacks, like I don't think you will have a good you wouldn't have a high success rate because you're not honing in. Like you can't get every possible lineup for a certain quarterback. Right. You know what I'm right. saying? Yep. Yep. Yes. I mean, I, I, I wouldn't read too much into the fact that you don't have a big win yet for NFL because uh, generally the contests are enormous. So it can take, take a long time to, even if you're a great player, it can take a long time to, to realize your edge for NFL. You still got to get super lucky to win at NFL. So uh, I wouldn't worry too much about that. Uh, are, and you said, are, are you playing a lot of NBA? I know you said that you started by playing NBA DFS. Is that uh, still something you're playing pretty regularly? I yeah, guess you I, said it's, it's your favorite sport to play. Yeah, it's favorite sport to play, not my most profitable, but like like NBA, I play that daily. So like I'm like, I'll, I'll try to 150, whatever. I'll, I'll play NBA. Um, I'm not like, I haven't like uh, hit, attacked the 150 top future tournament uh, in NBA like I had the baseball. But once I get my process down, like if I get a process that's down, then I definitely will. But especially, like I said, it's my favorite sport to watch, favorite sport to play. Okay. And is, is a late swap a big part of your process for NBA? Yeah. Yeah. NBA and it is for all uh, baseball too. So like it's uh, for people that are heavy into the sticks of baseball DFS, like um, you, it's hard on fantasy contra to do late swaps in, in the sense that and keep the percentages that you want. And, and the late stops is not like, hey, I'm going off of teams. It's just different lineups. Let's say a lineup at nine o'clock, San Francisco's playing or something. And, and you need to make a lot the swap, but you want to keep the same percentages. That's, you got to be able to prepare yourself to be able to do that. And part of that is being at the computer itself. Okay. So that's interesting that baseball is a big part of, or sorry, that late swap is a big part of your baseball process. Is that only like if the lineups come out different than you expected or uh, do you, do you late swap, you know, for example, if you're early players are doing really well. So if you're, you know, you have a, say you have a primary stack and a secondary uh, stack and your primary stack is doing great. Then would you, do you sometimes pivot to like a secondary stack that's more chalky than you were anticipating if your primary stack is doing well or that kind of thing, or, or do you only make late swaps? Like if it, if it's necessary based on the lineup being different than expected. Honestly, it's based off lineups. Um, I rarely okay. like, Hey, I'm doing good or I'm behind anybody. I'm going to switch off because like I said, I trust my process and I, and I throw randomness in there and I trust that randomness. Well, we can't, it's random. So can't trust us so much, but it's like, Hey, if I change this and I, and I, like I'm, there's, a, I'm putting a little bit of bias in it. So if I like, Hey, I want more of this guy, it's just, it's just, well, more of this team. Um, it's just not something I do. Yeah. I'm, I don't really do that for baseball either. I was just curious because you said it as part of your process, but yeah, I typically only use late swap for MLB if the lineups come out different than I was expecting as yeah. well, you could, I mean, I'm sure we could both gain a little bit of edge by like going in and tweaking things, you know, to, to make them, uh, to, to better suit the lineup based on what has already happened, but, uh, it's just not worth it. I'm not going to try and chase the min caches, you know, if my, if my lineup is failing or, you know, as you say, you gotta kind of trust your process sometimes in baseball. So, uh, not, not a big part of my process. What about NFL? Are you, are you a late swap guy for NFL? Yeah. Yeah. So NFL and NBA is a little different. Like if I'm tied with a couple guys and I got a high owned quarterback that's left and I'm looking at his salary his, you know, then yeah, I'm going to go to the low owned quarterback at that similar price or something just to get different. If I'm doing really like, like, or if I, if I need to catch somebody or something and we had, and I know they have Jalen Hurts and I have Jalen Hurts. I, I mean, Obviously, it's Jalen Hurts. He's gonna perform really well, but that's what you gotta to do to try to catch somebody, especially like, like you know, they're above you by ten fantasy points or something. Okay. But let's so say Kirk Cousins went off on Monday. <laughs> right. I wish. I wish Kirk Cousins <laughs> went off on Monday. <laughs> are you Are you a fan of any team? Um. Yeah, I'm a fan of Washington, so I have my experiences with Kirk. <laughs> oh, okay. All right. Yeah. You like that? Uh, all right. We, we got a listener question from Rob who uh, I, I'll, I'll read you the question. Do, do you remember? Uh, I'll read the question first and then ask you if you remember. Okay. If you could ask this question, Hey, it's your roommate, Robert from college in green Hill. Ask him why, when I was playing DFS in college, he didn't tell me he had DFS figured out. Uh, do, do you know who Rob is? Yes. Rob was. Um, so when I transferred out, out of playing division three, I went to Bradford university. Um, and this is before I went to Virginia tech. Um, and I was a freshman at the time and I got put into these off-campus apartments and these guys were seniors. Like 
and I, I was I thought I was doing something. Um, but these guys, like, you know, they're they're ready to graduate. They had their goals, uh, you know, they had goals and stuff. At my time, I'm, I'm still trying to drink and party and uh, go to school. Like, that's not, I wasn't even thinking about, like, sports betting in general. So it wasn't something that was on my radar. And I knew he liked sports, but I didn't know what he was doing. I didn't know he was doing DFS. And I like it wasn't until the next year, like, I was like, oh, I figured out what DFS was, uh, even was. That's really funny. So. Uh, for, for context, Rob and I had been DMing the day before I posted on Twitter that you were coming on the show. So it was just happenstance. Rob was our, Rob and I were already talking. And then I posted like, Hey, uh, no K, no game is coming on. And he, and then he DM me. He was like, Holy shit. I looked this guy up. This was my roommate in college. Yeah, yeah that's crazy. That is insane, <laughs> that's, a, that's a really funny story. Yeah. Uh, cool that you're both uh, getting that you're both really into DFS now. Unfortunate that you didn't know that about each other at the time, or, or that I guess you weren't into DFS yet at the time when yeah. we lived together, but uh, that's, that's pretty fun. Uh, I'm guessing some people who are going to watch this uh, will want to know. So, you know, you've talked about right now, you've got a full-time job as an engineer, um, but you might go full-time at DFS at some point. Would you ever consider getting into like DFS content or coaching or anything along those lines? Oh, yeah, that's something I, because I, I, I'm pretty open about my process. I kind of like to teach people about it. Um, it's something that I'm, I'm definitely considering. Like, it's just, you know, you know, it has, the money has to be right and lined up as far as like how much I'm making in DFS for me to make that jump. Because like I said, I'm a similar engineer and the money is pretty consistent and it's, and it's good money for my age and stuff. So it's just, it's definitely like it tears me apart because I still do love engineering. That's like something I grew up loving to do. But at the same time, I'm not gonna lie, doing DFS is 100% funner. So, yeah. so it's definitely something I want to consider. Like I can see, like even now, like I talk about DFS all the time in my free time. So, it's, DFS is something I, you know, if I could do it my whole life and do it full time, is I would definitely take that risk. Take that okay, time. and not just playing, but like like coaching or, or doing content. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. For me, that was like a big part of part of the reason I was comfortable quitting my my last job was. Well, I'll start doing a little bit of DFS content and, you know, that's a little bit of a little bit of extra income on the side so that I can kind of, you know, go through those peaks and valleys of the actual play in a little bit. Uh, so, yeah, I would I, I've enjoyed doing doing the content side and I'm sure you would be great at it uh, as you are at playing DFS. Um, so figured that was worth, worth that. talking about. Yeah, yeah. Um, all right. Uh, let's close it out by. Uh, I usually ask this question at the end of every show. Can you tell me about your favorite DFS win or win celebration? Um, so the, my, my favorite DFS win to this, to this date is still um, my first CSGO one. Um, so when I, when I won that CSGO one, it was like, okay, well, I actually can do this. And, and, and the story behind that was like, you know, I, I was grinding out to CSGO, trying to study the winning lineups. That, that's that's what I want to stress to everybody that's watching this show. If you take one thing, please just study line, winning lineups because that's the way I, like, that's the only way I'll ever win is based off research that I've done. And I copycat. It's just a copycat approach. Um, and, I, and okay, so I'm going a little bit off topic. Also, uh, so Alex and you and Tom followed me all at the same time. I was like, okay, they're they're researching, they're doing research. It's not, it's no, it's no brainer. They're studying lineup. They see what's working. Okay, that day, and then once y'all follow me that day, Alex hit me up on Twitter, said, "Hey, you've been killing it in MLB DFS." Next thing I know, he that night he dinks the MLB for fifty thousand dollars. So I'm like, okay, well, he, this co- it has to be copy. I don't, I didn't look at his process that day. If I was, in my head, I'm like, oh, it's a copycat game. It's just how it is. It is. Yeah, I'm, that, that's really funny. I didn't realize that Alex had just started following you. So Alex actually uh, pointed you out to me because he, he asked me, hey, do you know No Cane, No Game? And I was like, I know the username. I don't know him. Like, I, I recognize the username from, from playing the games. And I was like, yeah, he looks like he's a great, like, up-and-coming player. Like, just based on my metrics, he looks like he really knows what he's doing. You should talk to him. And I was like, well, do you know how I could get in touch with him? And he sent me your Twitter profile. So he must have he must have just found you that day, and he was excited to, uh, to find you, and he sent me your information. And then, of course... I reached out to you about uh, joining. I think that I think that's what happened. I reached out to you about joining, uh, coming on high stakes at that point because, uh, yeah, if you if you get the Alex Baker recommendation <laughs> seal of approval, I was like, all right, this guy's got to be a pretty great player. Uh, that's funny that uh, I didn't realize that we all started following you at the same time on Twitter. Yeah, it was, it was definitely. Weird. I only have like 30, 30 followers at the time on Twitter, so it's just like, okay, the top guys follow one of the top guys in the industry, and the Neil follow me. So it's like it's like, yeah, there's something up here. Like something's going on. And then, like I say, like as soon as he followed me, he messaged me, and then um, he won that fifty thousand. I remember congratulating him, but 
I don't know, 50,000 to him might be, it might be different than what it means to me. So yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Alex has a lot of those under his belt. So uh, <laughs> not as exciting for him as it is for most of us. Uh, but you know, 50,000 is 50,000. It's still always, always fun to win. And yeah, I would, I would echo what you're saying uh, that uh, the, the copycat nature of DFS in general, I think most of us have learned to become better players just from studying other players and even things that, you know, are, seem very intuitive now, like stacking, I don't think I was stack, like in, in baseball. I don't think I was stacking when I started playing yeah. and eventually I'm like seeing all the pros doing, it, I was like, Oh yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Like why would you not be stacking your players correlating your lineups in baseball? And uh, over time we all learn a lot from each other. Uh, so that one's still, still your favorite that, that CSGO took on like 30, 30 some thousand dollars on, on June 4th, 2020. Yeah. Cause that, that showed that I could do it. Um, but my big romance meant that when I won that 32,000, it was quick to go too. like, so, like as I'm getting older and becoming a more like serious defensor, the bankroll has become so so important. So I get a little bit more wiser. Uh, like I said, I'm still I'm, I'm 26 years old, so I'm still trying. And I'm never I was I wasn't a poker guy, nothing. So I didn't I don't know I didn't know how to manage bankroll. So when I won a 32,000, yeah, I was going next contest, go to high stakes and stuff. So but I, and I flirted around. I you know I still made some good money out of that too. But it wasn't till recently where you know at, you know okay if you want to take this serious, you got to you know spend one percent two percent of your bankroll every time and then just play that's, that's how awesome I, yeah that's my process now you, you've got more money than i had at 26 so uh so kudos to you and <laughs> I, I was wondering after you told me that you played against greg dorsch in high school i was like how young is this guy <laughs> like man is this guy like 21 years old like i was and i looked at I was, oh greg, greg dorch is 24 okay he's, he's older than i than i expected and and i guess he was younger than you as well so so not quite as young as i was like man am i this gonna be a 22 year old kid but uh 26 <laughs> so pretty young uh, yeah. that's, uh, it's, it's pretty fun to have the amount of success that you've had already at at 26 years old uh, very it. impressive all right kane uh where, where can people find you uh, they can find me at no can no game on Twitter handle, and that's why I really want to keep everything DFS related. So that's where you can find me. All right, just just find him on Twitter. No cane, no gain. No immediate plans to go into to coaching, but uh, you know maybe maybe you can try DMing him and see if Kane will respond to you. All right, oh, uh, oh, I will, I will. If you, okay. if you DM me, I don't have any followers, so I'll, I'll respond to you. <laughs> right, right. Yeah, as long as you have no followers, easy enough to respond to those who come in. All right. Well, thanks a lot, Kane. This is a really fun interview. Thanks for coming on the show. Appreciate having you. Episode 23. Uh, thanks to Mike Lawrence for producing. As always, you can find Mike at on Twitter at AwesomeYo. Uh, and thank you for watching. This has uh, been episode 23. You'll be able to find episode 24 of High Stakes uh, Friday, two weeks from now at uh, sometime mid-afternoon. I guess I don't know the exact time yet, but uh, look for it on the Stochastic YouTube channel. Thanks for watching. Enjoy your weekend. Thank you.